Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for our consideration today is the gospel reading appointed for this, the baptism of our Lord from Luke chapter 3, those verses which were read just a few moments ago. Way back in the 5th century B.C., that's 500 years before Christ, a mathematician and philosopher by the name of Zeno, Z-E-N-O, Zeno of Elia, was known for his paradoxical thought experiments, which questioned human assumptions of physical reality. To paraphrase one such experiment, Zeno proposes that we imagine the common experience of walking across a typical street. You got that picture in your head? You're going to walk across the street. Now, Zeno proposes that in doing so, after our first step, we are required to limit each further step to one half the distance of the previous step. Okay, so that means you step off the curb, you've gone two feet. Now the next step has to be one foot. And the next step has to be six inches. And the next step has to be three inches. The next step has to be, you get the point? So each step that you take is half the distance of the previous step. The paradox occurs as we realize that the distance of our previous steps can be halved infinitely <coughs> to ever even minuscule measurements, tiny, tiny measurements. In other words, Zeno is observing the possibility of constant forward motion that never arrives at the destination. I've messed with your mind enough now, okay? But you get the idea. You're always moving forward, but you never get to your final point because each step you take is half the distance in the previous step. Zeno's paradox has us always moving, seemingly making progress, but never getting anywhere. Well, have you ever felt that way in your life? <laughs> and maybe as you think ahead to eternity, do you ever wonder if you'll ever get what you want or need to go? Wouldn't you like to know if there is a solution to what's known now as the paradox of progress rather than the destination eluding us eternally? Well, in our gospel reading for today, beginning with verse 15 of Luke chapter 3, our eyes are directed to the crowds on the banks of the Jordan River described as people in expectation, a people waiting for something to happen. These expectant Israelites would easily appreciate the frustration found in Zeno's thought experiment, as they too were people who for generations moved a lot, figuratively and literally, but never seemed to get where they were truly desired to be. The crowds on Jordan's banks, these people in expectation, were also people in a predicament. They had, they felt held back by the oppression of Caesar and the Roman Empire. Uh, they had felt held back by the abuses of their own local government, Herod the Tetrarch after Herod the Great. These local kings instead of being beneficial advocates for them, were rather murderous tyrants. They used their subjects to further their own selfish interests. And is as if Roman rule and its puppets weren't bad enough, John tells these weary people that their own national heritage, their earthly descendancy from the mighty Abraham, would also get them nowhere. Heaven certainly appeared closed on this day. This was a frustrating predicament that had existed 
for thousands of years. It began when the first humans trusted that human knowledge rather than trust in their creator would get them where they wanted to be. You remember the incident in the Garden of Eden. They quickly learned that having one's eyes opened apart from God was not the great revelation that they expected, but rather it was quite deadly. From the dependence on human knowledge came the belief that we could move forward if we just had enough rules and regulations to get us through. Humanity got plenty of both, but quickly realized that they could not follow them, even when those rules and regulations were engraved in stone by God himself. <coughs> and then later, <coughs> it was thought that having a strong human leader, a wise a wonderful king would certainly get the people where they wanted to go. But again, failure. This is truly a distressing predicament. Knowledge had failed them. Rules had failed them. Government had failed them. These people had a history of movement and change that had gotten them nothing except captivity. The destination of heaven was closed, a predicament not just theirs, but one shared by the entire human race. Especially in our own troubled days, we identify with the predicament and weary frustration of the Israelite people on the shores of the Jordan River. We have seen firsthand the failure of human knowledge, the failure of human rules, the failure of human government to bring us to the destination that we seek. We too are people in a predicament, endlessly moving, but never getting anywhere. This predicament has existed since the time of the fall, but the deeper and ongoing problem is our powerlessness to do anything about it. And worse, we stubbornly refuse even to admit that we have a problem to realize that we are powerless to reach our destination. After all, we're moving, right? <laughs> Making progress, right? <laughs> Just a little more and we'll be there, right? In verse 15 of our text, the crowds turn their eyes to John the baptizer, thinking that this amazing man might be their solution, sinful though he was. John, however, in verse 16 quickly dispels the notion by recognizing his own powerlessness, his own unworthiness, even to untie the simple strap of the sandals of the real Savior. Herein lies the problem that keeps us in our predicament, our failure to accept our powerlessness. In Zeno's thought experiment, we find endless motion without a destination because we're trying to cross the final distance to the other side of the street with the infinite divisibility of the steps. The problem reminds us of the expectant Israelites on the banks of the Jordan of the fallen humanity throughout all the ages, except that here the finite has no means of assessing, achieving, or even comprehending an infinite that instead of dividing, multiplies the distance between us and the destination. In John's Gospel, our Lord explains, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. A broken, sinful human being is powerless to create anything from within itself that is not already there. That's our problem. In other words, the dinner you make is limited by the ingredients that you have. If we expect a greater than human solution from the ingredients of human knowledge, human rules, human politics, human ability, we will always, always be disappointed. Always moving, but never getting anywhere. Well, don't despair. Everything changes in verse 21 of our text. When Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened. Did you catch that? 
The heavens were opened. The destination is in sight. Everything that broken humanity has longed for since the expulsion from the Garden of Eden has now been made accessible. <coughs> for the first time since the fall and for all time evermore, the destination is now reachable. The Son of God, fully human and yet fully divine, in future time and timelessly crucified and risen from the dead, enters the waters of baptism. In this man, the infinite and the infinite are miraculously and incomprehensibly made one. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. Jesus Christ is now revealed. By the Father's own voice, he's revealed. He's revealed to be the only perfect, infinite human worthy of the perfect, infinite destination because he is the creator of that destination. Heaven is open to Christ because it belongs to him. John's baptism, Jesus' baptism provides the same progress for us. How? How does Jesus' baptism end our predicament? It does so because the Son of God, as the Word, in a miraculous way, remains in the water of baptism. He enters the water for all time so that he might meet us in our baptism. In the water of our baptism, our failed humanity is killed with Christ on the cross. And in that same water, Christ provides the life-giving Holy Spirit who creates the faith which receives infinite life. As St. Paul puts it, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we might, too, walk in newness of life. In the water of baptism, the infinite Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has, from outside of our reality, reached in and miraculously joined us to himself. St. Paul puts it this way, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. It's one of the reasons that your pastors wear garb like this. This alb is to remind you that you have put on Christ. It covers our sinfulness. We are walking, talking object lessons when we are vested in these strange robes. It's to remind you that you too have put on Christ when you were baptized. Did you also notice the baptismal font is front and center? It's to remind you of your baptism. Did you also notice that there's a mobile, a glass mobile hanging above the center doors here as you enter the nave? It's a dove and water drops reminding you that you have become part of his church through your baptism. It's interesting, good old Albert Einstein, in describing the effects of quantum mechanics, explained how objects could be able to, should be able to affect each other even when separated by vast distances. Now, this is way beyond my comprehension, but he referred to this idea and this is where you can see Albert Einstein has a sense of humor. He referred to this as spooky action at a distance. <laughs> okay? That's what he called this. He referred to this concept, was, uh, this concept that he proposed was later proven mathematically in something referred to as entanglement theory. Now, I'm not going to get all this. is way beyond my understanding. But in 2019... 
Researchers at the University of Glasgow were able to photograph physical evidence that photons, they're minute atomic particles, smaller than an electron or a proton, you know, really tiny, can be entangled in such a way that they exhibit the same responses to stimuli even when separated by vast distances of space and even possibly even time. The point is, is that this aspect was revealed in nature. God is a wonderful creator, isn't he? And if this is possible in our natural observable universe, imagine what is possible when we are joined to the divine supernatural Christ in our baptism. For so his baptism truly united him to us. As I referred before, St. Paul said, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So we can truly rejoice. You have received what you could not yourself achieve. For in your baptism, the power of God's Son, His Word, has brought the destination down to you, granting you the assurance of heaven, even though you admit your own powerlessness. This idea of power and powerlessness reminds me of one of my earliest memories. Riding on my father's foot as a little child. Maybe you did this as a child, if you remember back that far. Did you ever do this? For when I was a toddler, so young that I could barely walk without falling, I have happy memories of my father placing me on his comparatively giant foot. And while I held very tightly to his leg, he would then walk around the house as I shouted with great joy. For a moment I became one with his leg, with my big, powerful father. I could walk as he walked, do what he did, because I had become part of him. My father would eventually pry me off his tired foot, but for that brief time, I could go anywhere and do anything despite my own limitations. Even more confidence can be found in our baptism. Jesus' baptism and our baptism is the provider of true progress. Yes, we confess that we are powerless to solve the problems that lead to our predicament. But in the water of our baptism, we, the powerless, have been joined to our crucified and risen creator. Not briefly, but forever. Contrary to all earthly appearances, despite our endless failures, we rejoice in this tangible assurance that our predicament has now ended. Our problem has been solved. And the means to arrive at our heavenly de destination, long hoped for, true progress, has now been provided. So I close with the words from our Old Testament reading from the prophet Isaiah. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. In the name of Christ, amen. Now may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.